Y'all, Dixie here. Now let's talk about something that I feel like is a hacker's favorite thing to talk about, and that is food. So what do you eat on a six month long backpacking trip? Well, pretty much anything that can sit on a shelf and not rot. I mean, there is some leeway to that. You can actually take things out on trail, especially in cooler temperatures that you might think would have to be refrigerated, like cheese and pepperoni. My friend Perk even took out some milk and made pancakes, I don't know how that ended up working out, but don't get sick. I'm just saying that there are some things in cooler temperatures that will actually hold up for a few days. First, before you decide what you're gonna pack to eat, you've gotta decide, do you wanna cook or do you not wanna fool with cooking? One of the benefits to cooking is you're gonna have more of a variety of things that you can eat because you can also eat all of the non-cooked stuff that the non-cookers would pack out. But for me, I liked having the morale booster of knowing there was a warm meal when I got to camp. For some people, knowing that they have to deal with the process of cooking and then cleaning a pot is just overwhelming and they don't want to fool with it. So you're just really going to have to reach inside yourself and figure that one out. On the AT, I alternated a lot between cooking and not cooking for breakfast and lunch, but for dinner, I pretty much always cooked except for I think one rare time where I decided to stop and camp and I was out of water, or at least I didn't have enough to cook, so I ate snacks. But anyway, let's run through an example of if I had cooked for each meal, what that would have looked like for me. Now there is a whole variety out there, but this will at least give you a starting point. For breakfast, I always like to start off with coffee. There are a lot of different ways that you can prepare coffee on trail, but what I found the easiest to get up and get going was just little single serve packets of instant coffee added to an instant breakfast. If I had some dehydrated powdered milk and a little honey bear that I could find, then I might mix in some milk and honey. For food, something quick like oatmeal, grits, or cream of wheat, and if I had some dehydrated fruit or nuts that I could throw in, then I'd add that too. For lunch, if I'm gonna cook, I want something that rehydrates quickly, so maybe Raymond noodles or couscous with some dehydrated vegetables added in, and even maybe some fresh spinach. That's one of the other things that typically you would refrigerate that will do well on trail, especially if it's in cooler temperatures. And I try to have a protein source at lunch, so you could throw in some pepperoni or spam and just cut it up and put it in. Maybe cover everything with some cheese on top, a cheese stick, or sprinkle Parmesan cheese. And then for dinner, I would save those pastas that take a little bit longer to cook and rehydrate like nor pasta sides or rice sides or maybe even macaroni and cheese and again throw in some dehydrated vegetables or spinach if I had it on hand and then for a protein source for dinner I really love to have dehydrated ground beef you can purchase this from Mountain House like a whole can of it and package it separately and have some sent to you if you wanted to deal with the troubles of picking up a package. Uh, but I actually dehydrated a lot myself. There's a pretty simple recipe that I have for it that I got from backpackingchef.com and I actually have a video on that whole process too. I'll link to that in the video description. It's not necessary for hiking the AT, so I won't go into it on this video, but that is something that I really enjoyed being able to add to my pastas or even something like instant mashed potatoes where I could throw in a cheese stick too and then it was like a, a very lacking shepherd's pie. And probably the easiest type meal to clean up, especially at dinner time when you're just ready to go to bed, are Mountain House meals or any of the other mini brands out there where it's a, a packet that you pour boiling water into, seal it up, let it do its thing, and then you eat it and throw it away. So there's no cleaning of a pot or anything like that. Those can be pretty pricey though, so over time it adds up, but it's nice to treat yourself every once in a while. Even if I were to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner in a day, I would still have snacks, usually mid-morning between breakfast and lunch, and then again between lunch and dinner. And if I was really hungry, then sometimes I have snacks even after dinner. But I just didn't want you to think that the cook stuff was all I took out on trail. It's always good to have some snacks. And I always 
like to add a little bit extra in there just in case because if I'm in a situation where I run out of fuel unexpectedly or I lose my stove or a lighter, then I know I've got something to eat. Now let's go over an example menu of what I would pack if I decided to not cook. For breakfast, I would still do the instant coffee with a carnation breakfast and I probably use about half of the packet of the carnation instant breakfast to one single serving of the instant coffee. But anyway, instead of heating it up, I would throw it in a plastic bottle used for drink mixes and shake it up and drink it cold. But I need that caffeine in the morning. Then for breakfast itself, I could have some sort of granola bar, kind bar. Other ideas might include cereal with powdered milk and water. It actually turns out okay, especially if the water is cold. You can kind of trick yourself into believing it's cold milk from the fridge, but you would still need some sort of bowl or larger cup and spoon to do this. But I think it's a good idea to have that stuff anyway, especially if you have a bowl or cup that you could put on the fire and warm up water if you wanted to, like an emergency, you needed warm water, hypothermia, you need to drink something warm, or just for whatever reason, maybe you decide you want hot coffee one morning because somebody's got a fire going. Bacon jerky is really good in the morning and could be a great addition to cooked meals, but also for meals not cooked. And oatmeal is surprisingly good if you get the instant oatmeal packets. If you just add cold water, you don't even have to heat it up and it reestablishes just fine. And, and honestly, I might like the cold better than when it's heated up. For lunch, you could do something like a tortilla with some peanut butter and honey. I about made myself sick of that for the first several weeks of the AT. But wraps are great for putting all sorts of different stuff in. You could do tuna and mayo, etc. Other ideas might include English muffins. I've done pepperoni and spinach on an English muffin or summer sausage, spam packets, as I mentioned before. And they even have chicken in foil packets. For dinner, I would do pretty much more of the same of whatever I did for lunch. I would try not to do the same exact thing though, just because you will quickly tire out of the same thing over and over. Even if you think, oh my gosh, this is my favorite thing in the world. I could never get sick of this. The trail will test that. And another option for people who don't want to fuss with cooking, but they like the idea of having something that's rehydrated, you could look into cold soaking. Cold soaking, from what I understand, I've never done it myself, but you take a sealable container and throw in whatever you want to rehydrate, like noodles, and you add the water that you need. I assume it would take a little playing around to figure out exactly how much you need for each thing, but then you just let it sit there and give it time and it will rehydrate. But this will still take a little planning for certain things, I assume, that take longer to rehydrate. So for dinner, you might wanna go on and get this ready to go a couple hours before, again, however long it takes. And for breakfast, you might do it at night for whatever you're eating in the morning. But something to look into if you're wanting to mix it up a little bit. I think one of the reasons that some people decide not to cook in addition to just not feeling like it is they want to save weight on having a fuel stove and any other thing that you might have in your kitchen set up. But on the opposite side of things, some people argue that no cook food is heavier than the food that people cook because it's been dehydrated. And yes, that may be true, but if you're cooking, you do have that added weight of your kitchen setup. So I feel like all in all, it kind of evens out and you should really just decide, is this something I wanna do? Will it bring me joy and happiness to have a hot meal and hot food on the trail? Or is it gonna feel burdensome? And the great thing is you can always change your mind and have a stove etc sent to you or purchase one from an outfitter on the trail or you can package up your cooking equipment and send it back home. How much food you actually need will probably vary per individual but also for yourself that will vary from the start to the finish of the trail. When I first get out on trail I always think oh my gosh everyone talks about hiker hunger I'm gonna be so hungry I should pack a lot of food but I feel like one of the mistakes that people make 
when they start the Appalachian Trail is carrying too much food. If you ask pass through hikers, they'll say, yeah, I definitely started with way too much. But we pack our fears and the thought of being out in the woods and not having food to eat is pretty scary. But the rule of thumb is about two pounds per person per day. So if you weigh your food bag and you know about how many days your first stretch will be and you multiply that by two, and that's what your food bag weighs or close to it, then you're in the right range anyway. You're probably not gonna starve to death. But as you do keep moving along down the trail, your body gets used to that high mileage or increasing mileage that you're gonna be doing, probably more exercise than you've ever done in your life, and it will adjust accordingly and you'll feel like you could eat everything that a restaurant has to offer. But that'll come on relatively slowly you'll start to notice that in yourself and you can adjust as you're shopping along the trail. Once you get into the swing of it you won't have to worry about oh my gosh I have to find a scale so I can measure to see if I have enough food. You'll know that you have enough just by how you've been eating. But I always recommend taking the amount of food you think you need for each day plus a half a day more and I'll usually throw in an extra thing for a dinner and a little bit more in the way of snacks. That way, if I get hung up in some bad weather or if I decide to take a zero because one spot that I camp at is particularly beautiful, then I have that option and flexibility. Or if I come across somebody else who has really messed up with their food planning and they need some snacks or a meal for dinner, then I'll feel good knowing I can help them out. So what do you put all of your food in? Do you just throw it in your pack? I mean, you can, but it's nicer when all of it is together in a food bag or a dry bag. The reason you want your bag to be at least waterproof to the rain is it's gonna double as your bear bag, which will hang up at night so bears don't come into your tent or shelter to steal your food. And if you've got a box of mac and cheese or some loose packets of oatmeal, you might not want those getting soggy. So while I have seen people use things like Walmart bags for their bear bag, I would recommend getting something a little bit more durable. Now it doesn't have to be a dry bag like you would take kayaking that's submergible. Those tend to be really heavy, but I used a no limits 15 liter dry bag for my through hike of the AT. I think it was $10. It didn't weigh very much and it held up pretty well. I had to do a little surgery on it with some tape and stitch it up with some floss at one point. But all in all, it worked out fine. If I had to do it again, I would probably have opted for a 20 liter bag just to give me more wiggle room. There were some days where if I had, say, a six day carry, I might be putting all of my snacks stuffed in my hip belt pockets or the mesh pocket of my pack because there was no more room in my food bag. But my go-to now for a food bag slash bear bag is the Z-Packs bear bagging kit. I like it because it comes with the food bag, a little rock sack to make bear bagging a little bit easier, and 50 feet of Z-Line. Now don't worry, I will get into bear bagging later in detail, but I like that all of the components of this kit come together. You can get a separate dry bag like I mentioned before and separate cord. I understand that not everybody wants to spend $50 on a bear bagging kit so if you want to get your components separately I would just say make sure you get at least 50 feet of cord. You don't really need more than that and I actually robbed a few pieces of cord for different things off of my 50 foot while I was on the AT and it was still enough. But a lot of people tend to lean towards getting paracord, that's like the cord of the outdoors. But it's really actually kind of heavy. So I would shop around and see if you can't find something more lightweight. Because the only weight that's gonna be on this cord is your food, so it's just not necessary really to go with paracord. Z-Pax does sell their cordage separately if you wanna check out what they have. And also your local outfitter should have some different options. Something that you might not think about, but it's really convenient if you have some sort of trash bag because you might have a tuna packet that's got tuna juice in it still and you don't wanna just throw that loosely inside your food bag and have everything with tuna juice all over it. I carry a gallon Ziploc bag for my trash bag. I usually try to find a freezer bag just because they seem to be a little bit more durable and it might last me a couple of stretches washing it out in town and then taking it back out on trail. The main thing that I will suggest to you about food is to not over plan it before you go. I don't know what I want to eat 
for dinner three days from now, let alone do I know what I want to eat four months and three days from now. Some people will think that they need to mail themselves boxes, resupply boxes to every town stop and they'll sit down and come up with a spreadsheet. Okay, I'm gonna stop at this town, this town, this town, this town. So I gotta get the addresses for all the post offices and package up these meals. But like I said, what you want to eat will vary. How much you can eat will vary. So it just doesn't really make sense to package up all of these meals and send them off to yourself. So you're paying for the food and then the postage to send it when you could have just shopped for it in the town that you're gonna take a break in. The only reason I can see that it makes sense to do something like mail yourself resupply packages to every town is if you're on a very restrictive diet. And the typical backpacker's diet is a very unhealthy diet. And a lot of people will tell you, well, if you're out there doing big miles, then it doesn't really matter because your body's burning through all that anyway. I have mixed emotions about that. I mean, sure, you're burning through the poison, but like it's still poison. It is difficult to maintain a healthy diet while backpacking, but I suggest that in any way possible that you can find a way to do that. Even if it's on days while you're in town, eat as healthy as you can. That's what I've done in the past, but I don't want to suggest that this is a good diet. But most of these towns that you'll go through, especially on the Appalachian Trail, have become very familiar with the hiker community. They want a chance to sell things to hikers and create businesses around that. So even if it's a glorified gas station in a town stop or a convenience store, they typically do stock things that hikers ask for the most. Now, there may be a few places where it's a good idea to send a box because the food is specifically really expensive there to resupply or there aren't a lot of options and it's basically snacks that you'll be resupplying from. I'll put a link to an article in the video description that talks about some of these stops that you might consider sending a box to. And also, as I mentioned before, if you want to do something to help your food be a little bit healthier, or have more variety, like the dehydrated ground beef or dehydrated vegetables, then those things make sense to me because that's stuff that you're likely not going to get in a town stop. If you are gonna be sending yourself boxes along the way, even if it's just specific locations or you're gonna need certain gear at different stops, I'll talk about sending boxes to yourself on trail or having somebody else send them later on in the video. And now cookware. If you're gonna cook any of your meals on stove, you've got to have a little mini kitchen setup. And there are a lot of different stove options, so let's start with those. First, I wanna cover liquid fuel slash alcohol stoves. The pros of these are, first, they can be really inexpensive and lightweight. Two, you know exactly how much fuel you have because it's liquid in a bottle, so there's no guessing game. Three, denatured alcohol is inexpensive and is available at a lot of different places. You can even use the yellow heat that you would see used in a car. So if there's a parts store in town, then you know you can purchase fuel somewhere. Some of the not so great things about alcohol stoves are, first, you can't adjust the flame, so there's no getting fancy with cooking necessarily. I guess you'd have to have a lot of skill maybe with the the height of your pot off the flame or something, but there's no turning down a flame and simmering something. It's just full on flame. Two, you might not know the exact amount of fuel that you need. I'm sure you'll get better with it as you go. So when you're done cooking, you might still have to let the rest of that fuel burn off. And three, if you spill an alcohol stove, it can be kind of scary because everything that spills goes up in a flame. So if you're interested in alcohol stoves, you can purchase different ones online. If you're on a tight budget, you can use a tuna can and make one of your own. You just need a tuna can and a hole punch. You punch holes around the top rim of the can to allow air to get in and that's it. And I saw that anti-gravity gear has some cool ones made out of aluminum cans for only $15. Fuel canister stoves are just like they sound. A canister fuel and the stove screws onto the top. Fuel canister stoves are the most common stove you'll see hikers using on the Appalachian Trail. Because of this, one of the pros of using a fuel canister stove is 
You'll find fuel cans readily available in town stops for about five to seven dollars a piece. With fuel canister stoves, you'll have a valve that allows you to adjust the heat. So if you want to get fancy with your cooking and saute something or simmer something, then you will have the capability to control the flame. There's no mess to deal with as your stove will just screw right on top of the fuel canister and it pushes down a valve on the inside of the fuel can so there's no pouring liquids or anything like that. On the flip side, with a fuel canister, you can't see exactly how much fuel you have left in it. So you kind of have to get used to the weight of how they feel when they're about to run out. Also by shaking, you can kind of hear and start gauging how much a fuel can has left in it. The metal canister itself is kind of heavy so even if you've got an empty fuel can you still have a significant amount of weight that you're carrying whereas with the alcohol stoves if you've got a lightweight plastic bottle then you're not carrying as much constant weight. With fuel canister stoves you've got the fuel can and the stove stacked on top so it can be a little bit top heavy when you then have a pot with water and food in it there were a couple of times that I flipped over my pot and ended up with my dinner on the ground. So it's always good to have extra snacks just in case. But this is one of the downsides to a fuel can stove versus an alcohol stove. For my AT trip, I chose an MSR pocket rocket stove. And the ones that they have now are even more lightweight and more compact than the one that I used. But after the AT, I went to another stove. I won't say that I necessarily upgraded. Uh, it's a smaller stove and it's more lightweight. It only weighs just under an ounce, but it doesn't have as much wingspan. So you've got less stability in your stove setup and possibly if you're not paying attention, more dumped out meals. I also think that this stove is less efficient, but it is really affordable and it only costs about $15 on Amazon. But just for a general idea, one of those small fuel canisters, if I was only making coffee in the morning and cooking dinner at night, it'd probably last me close to a week. So if you start your first stretch, if you're starting at Springer Mountain and going to Neil Gap, and you start with a single fuel canister, one of the smaller ones, by the time you get to Neil Gap, you should still have fuel, even if you cook three meals a day. Uh, but by then you'll be able to gauge a little bit better how much you were cooking and how much you actually used. I want to mention one more type of backpack and stove that is rarely used during through hikes, but it's definitely an option and that is a wood stove. One of the pros of using a stove that needs wood to burn is you don't have to buy any fuel and you're never really out of fuel because you're hiking in the woods where you'll always be finding little twigs and sticks. Also, some of the wood stoves that I've seen can actually charge your electronics too. I think it takes a lot of burning time to significantly charge anything. I'm sure that technology is getting better over time, but it would be kind of cool to have if you were in a pinch and needed to charge your headlamp or your phone. But some things to think about that could kind of go wrong. First, if it's been raining for days and days and everything is damp and wood is soaked through, then it might be trickier to get your fire going in your stove. I'm not saying it's impossible because you could definitely pick up some twigs. I've heard people say if you carry them in your pocket for a while, they'll kind of dry out and warm up with your body heat. Um, but there's just something else to think about and kind of fool with. It's not as straightforward and simple. In general, cooking with a wood stove is going to take more time and effort and skill. Also, wood stoves typically are heavier options and often more expensive than the other options. But I was poking around and checking out wood stoves recently and I saw a Little Bug Junior that only weighs 5.1 ounces, which still seems like it's on the heavier side when you consider that my BRS stove is only one ounce, but also you won't have the weight of a fuel canister, so it kind of evens out. And the thing that I liked about the Little Bug Junior is that you can use it as a wood stove or also an alcohol stove. So I like that it has that 
little dual purpose thing. So I guess you wouldn't have to carry as much alcohol, but if you were going into a, a rainy stretch, then knowing you could still use it without having to fight with wet wood, that would be nice. It does cost $70, so it is on the pricey side of things when you compare it to the $15 BRS stove. But if you're just set on having a wood stove, then this seems like it might be a good one to try out. So now you've picked your stove and you've got to find a pot to cook in. First of all, the size of your pot will be dependent on what you're going to do with it. If you're only going to boil water and then dump it into something like a mountain house meal to let it rehydrate, then you don't need as big of a pot as if you're going to dump in a pasta sides and have the water and the pasta sides and space to stir. So I aimed for a one liter pot because I wanted to have versatility. I wanted to be able to pour mac and cheese in my pot and boil it if I wanted to. One liter worked absolutely fine for me for mac and cheese, pasta sides, rice sides. Some of them you got to be a little careful when you're stirring, but anything less than a liter would have been tough. As far as materials go, you'll see stainless steel, titanium, etc. Stainless steel is fine, but it's on the heavier side of things, so I would avoid that if you can. Titanium is going to be much more expensive, but durable. It'll last you a long time. I ended up opting for aluminum. I went with a Stanco aluminum grease pot and I know that it's not recommended that you cook in aluminum so I'm not telling you to do that but that's just what I did. It only cost me about eight dollars at a Kmart at the time that I got it and it's just as lightweight or maybe even more lightweight than some of the titanium options I saw out there. Stanco grease pots go for about fifteen dollars now on Amazon but sometimes you can find them at flea malls. I would say that titanium would be the safest option and also a good solid pot to have that's gonna be lightweight. But if your heart is set on a titanium pot, you don't have to pay full price. You can probably find some used online. Facebook has a lot of resources for used backpacking gear groups, etc. I just wanna say a quick word on pot cozies. These are definitely, I guess, a luxury item, you would say, because it's not a necessity. But I really enjoyed having a pot cozy, so I just want to share with you all in case you think you would like it too. I made my own pot cozy out of Reflectix. But the idea of the pot cozy is it allows you to save fuel. And also, it's really nice when you're holding a hot pot inside of some Reflectix material because you don't have to worry about burning your hands. The way that the cozy can help save fuel is you boil your water, dump whatever food in, pasta sides, rice sides, bring it to a bowl, and then once it's going pretty good, you might even let it go for a minute or so, you take it off of the heat and put it in the cozy, put the lid on, put the cozy lid on, and then let it sit there for about 10 minutes. And the Reflectix holds in that heat so the food continues to rehydrate. So you're not having to sit there with the flame constantly going and fuel burning. So it saves at least a few minutes of fuel burning time each time you cook. Now let's talk about your utensil. First, you gotta decide, are you a spooner or a sporker? When I started the AT, I decided that I was a sporker. I don't know why, I guess I thought, just in case I need those little tines, I wanna have them, but after that, I didn't need the time so I actually ended up replacing my spork with a spoon because I found the long handled spoons made by Tokes. I like the long handle spoon because if you've got one of those backpacker meals like Mountain House then having the long spoon prevents you from having to dig your hand down all inside that food pouch. But even if you are a sporker Tokes long handled sporks also exist. Now a titanium spork or spoon is gonna cost about eight to $15. You can definitely find a spoon or a spork that's plastic that will be much cheaper, but I saw a lot of people break their plastic spoons and sporks along the way. So it just kind of makes sense if you're gonna be backpacking for a long period of time to get something that you know is gonna be durable and hold up. For free, you can always just grab a spoon from the house and bring it along too. But if you are out on trail and you get in a pinch because you've lost or just destroyed a plastic utensil, 
you can always use a tent stake to stir your food and to kind of help shovel it in. A cup is also one of those optional items that I opted to have. I wanted to be able to eat my hot oatmeal in my pot and drink my hot coffee in my cup at the same time if I wanted to without having to mix them together. If you don't have that same desire, then you could make your coffee in your pot and drink it and then make your food and eat that. What I like about the cup that I selected for the AT and that's the Sea to Summit collapsible mug is it's got little measurement increments on the inside of it. So when I'm cooking and a rice sides or pasta sides calls for one and one third cup, then I can easily measure that. Also, I like that the cup collapses and doesn't take up a lot of space. It only weighs 1.6 ounces and they're pretty reasonable in price. They cost about $12 on Amazon. Another thing you can do for measuring water though, if you don't want to carry a cup and you do want to know how much water you're putting in your food pot, when you're at home before you go, you can fill up your pot to different levels, a quarter cup, and then you can take like a popsicle stick or a plastic equivalent and put down in the pot, draw a line where that measurement is of the quarter cup and write a quarter cup and then go up from there. But that way when you're out on trail, all you gotta do is stick your little stick down in the pot, fill up water to the line that you want. Don't forget in your kitchen, you're gonna need a ladder. I trust those big ladders that you can't see through. I know it can be nerve wracking not knowing how much fluid you have, but if you're only gonna be using a ladder to cook and start fires, one big ladder lasted me all the way from Georgia to Maine. Now I do like to carry a smaller big ladder and I put that in my repair slash first aid kit. That way if I misplace my main ladder or it gets wet, then I do have a backup. I also like to keep a bandana with my cooking setup. That way I can use it as a hot pad when I'm putting my pot on the heat and especially when I'm taking it off. But also after I wash my pot, I like to be able to dry it out one good time with that bandana. I wanna answer a question real quick before moving on about washing your food pot. I've had people tell me I should make a video on washing your food pot, but I just feel like it would be a really short video because what I do is very simple. I do not take soap out on trail with me. Some people like to so they can do a quick little bathing of themselves and they like to wash their food pot they just feel better about it using soap but regardless of if you're using soap or not make sure that you are 100 feet away from the water source when you're washing your food pot you don't need to be in the water source scrub a dub dubbing so anyway away from the water source i just squirt some water in my food pot and take my finger and scrub all around in that food pot and rinse it out and i repeat as necessary until it's clean and if I'm having a hard time with some stuff that's really clinging on and doesn't want to let go, I'll just take a dead leaf and use it as a little scrubber. And once I'm done, like I said, I like to take a bandana and wipe it out one good time to make sure it's dry. And that's literally it. Resupplying mail drops and bounce boxes. As I mentioned before, if you're going to be eating the typical hiker junky food diet, then shopping wherever you're at on trail makes more sense than packaging all of these food boxes to send to yourself along the AT. Because instead of paying for postage and the food, you can just pay for the food while you're out there. But for your first town stop, whether you're going northbound or southbound, I would recommend sending yourself a resupply package there. For going northbound, your first stop will be Neal Gap, and there is an outfitter there called Mountain Crossings that, to my knowledge, is the only resupply point within walking distance, or at least it was in 2015. And going southbound with Monson, Maine being your first stop, checking the Far Out app today, it looks like there's at least a general store there. But neither one of these stops have a huge variety of stuff from what I remember. And also they can be a little bit more pricey than some of the other town stops you'll have along the way just because there isn't a whole lot of competition there. But if you don't receive a mail drop at these places, or even if you do, chances are the hiker boxes in both of these town stops will have 
a decent amount of stuff in it, especially at Neal Gap if you're going northbound, because a lot of times hikers will overpack their food boxes. And after walking that whole first stretch, when the hiker gets there and gets their food box, they're going to be like, man, I don't want to carry all of this weight. I was already too heavy in this last section, so I'm going to dump some of this food or extra gear in the hiker box. So be on a lookout for the hiker boxes. If y'all aren't familiar with those, they are boxes where hikers can drop any additional food or gear that they're not going to use in hopes that another hiker will. I've got a list of seven stops that I think a hiker would appreciate receiving a resupply box at. Now, this isn't saying that if you don't have a food drop there, you'll go hungry because there is something, but again, selection and prices might be a reason for receiving a food drop at these places. And the seven are, as I mentioned, Neil Gap in Georgia, the NOC, which is the Nantahala Outdoor Center in North Carolina, Fontana Dam, North Carolina, Bland, Virginia, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, Caratunk, Maine, and as I mentioned, Monson, Maine. I'm not saying these are the only seven places that you might want to receive a food drop, but those are ones that I noted while I was out there. But you don't necessarily even have to, before you leave home, pack up seven food boxes and mail to these places. It's actually something that you can do while you're on trail. Now, obviously for your first stop being Neil Gap, or if you're coming southbound Monson, you need to go ahead and do that before you leave home. But the other ones or any others that you hear about while you're out on trail, you can actually do while you're in a town that has a decent resupply. If you're somewhere that has a Walmart with all of the things that you might want, you can package yourself up a food box and mail it to a town that you've heard about has a poor selection. Just saying you can take some of the weight off of yourself of things that you have to do before you leave and you know procrastinate a little bit and worry about it later. You have a couple of options for mailing yourself a package. You can either send it to a post office or you can send it to a business like a hostel, sometimes gas stations or other places will accept hiker packages from hikers. And these places that will receive boxes will be listed in the Far Out app and also in the guidebooks. When sending yourself mail down the trail or if somebody else is sending you mail, make sure that they put your actual legal name and not your trail name. While in the trail community, it's very common to go by a nickname or a trail name, the post office needs to see proof of who you are, so your ID is probably not going to say Mountain Goat. You also want to include your ETA of when you might be there. It doesn't have to be the exact date, but just a general range. A lot of places like the post offices and even hostels will kind of organize packages as to when hikers think they might come through. And decorating your box somehow with some bright duct tape or drawing things on the side of it, writing your last name big on each side of the box will also help identify your box so they can get it quickly. If you're gonna be sending your resupply package to a post office, then you wanna use this format on the box. And if you're mailing a package to a hostel or another business, then you wanna use this format. Keep in mind that wherever you send your package to, you'll have to work around their business hours to pick up your package. Post offices can have more limited hours, especially in smaller towns. I've found towns that post offices are only open a few days. So in that instance, you might wanna look at a nearby hostel that could receive your package for you. And sometimes even if you're not staying at a hostel, they'll still receive your package for a small fee. Uh, but I would definitely compare the hours of the two and see what you think will work best for you because it's horrible showing up at a post office five minutes late on a Friday and they're closed until Monday. So now you have the option of sitting in town all weekend or just bypassing your box. Some post offices in these instances will work with you and if you call them, they'll bounce it ahead for you. But unfortunately, you could run into an issue where they won't do that for you. And in that instance, you might have some luck going to another post office down the trail, showing your ID and asking them to call the other post office because they can prove that it's your name on the ID 
and if the other one can look at the package and see that it has your ID, then they might can work something out. Bounce boxes can be useful for people for a variety of different reasons, but especially if you're coming from overseas and you can't have gear sent from home because it'll be really expensive to mail internationally and you don't know exactly at what point you might need that certain gear, like your warmer rated sleeping bag, then a bounce box might be useful. And even if you do have a good support system, some people like to bounce ahead things like clothes for town or certain treats that would be too heavy to carry otherwise, certain luxury items. So in these instances, you can put the items that you'll need later down the trail in a box and as long as you put it in a priority box then if you get to the town stop say you mail it 200 or 300 miles ahead then when you get there if you decide that you don't want to open the box because you're not going to use this stuff yet you can have it mailed ahead again for free but if you do open the box and use the stuff then you'll have to pay for it to mail it again. You can talk to the post office about what would be the most cost effective way. If your package is heavy enough, you might wanna use a flat rate box, but otherwise there are options like a regional priority box. Sending a bounce box can be expensive if you're never actually bouncing it, so that's why it makes more sense if it's something that you're not picking up in every single town. And just a side note for getting things delivered to a post office, if you're gonna order something on Amazon, then you need to call the specific post office that you're planning to have it sent to general delivery and ask them if they will accept packages from UPS or FedEx. If they don't, then your best bet is to wait until you can have it delivered to a business and then I would still call the place and make sure that FedEx or UPS will deliver there. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today on this topic. If you wanna watch one big video with all of this information about the AT, but it's split up by timestamps, then you can click right here. Or if you wanna watch my through hike of the AT, then you can check that out below. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop those in the comments and we will see y'all next time.